Good morning, everyone. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Chuck Bonanno. I'm the Vice President of Dealer Development for NIDA. Uh, my little department and division of guys and girls is all about educating you guys through all of our programs out there. And um, I've been doing this for 30 years now. Mike Clark, that makes us old, doesn't it? Man. And when I say up there, every, forget everything you know about collections. This actually came to me when I was redoing one of our collection boot camp slide presentations and thinking about all the things that I learned. And just so you know, I learned how to do buy here, pay here from A, a brother-in-law at the time, but B, a gentleman named Jim DeVoe. I went up to Indiana way back when, before he even had JD in JD Buy Rider and taught you everything you need to know about buy here, pay here. And I was thinking about all the things that have stayed the same and oh my God, how many things have changed. How many things we thought were the most important things in the world? Turns out, maybe they're not. So what I'm going to share with you today is some of the different aspects of collections that you may think are really, really important that may not be, and some things that you aren't thinking is as important that are. And I want to preface the whole thing by saying, if everything is working for you right now, go have some coffee. Because I'm not here to change your mind, I'm here to open your mind about thinking about some things and things that I've done in my career in Buy Here, Pay Here, things that I watch my 20 group members. I've moderated 476 20 group meetings, so I've seen it done every way. I've seen it done well. I've seen it done very poorly. I've seen people change and watch the changes that they make. So I get to tell you that don't trust me, I can show you experience of, of people who've made changes out there. How many people in the room have been in Buy Here, Pay Here as long as I have? I knew Mike has, and Steve has, and John Stepanek has, and Luke, you're only 31. Stop it. <laughs> um, how about, let's see, how about 15 years, 10 or 15 years? Okay. How about less than that? Okay. So you've never seen the old way. So when I started in Buy Here, Pay Here, do you think we had devices? We didn't even have DMS systems. I learned how to collect with a ledger card and a tickle file. So if you know what that is, you are really old. Okay. We didn't have no stinking computers. We just put a card and took their money every Friday. So it's changed quite a bit, but this has always been a finance business. We are financing transportation. And whatever term of note you have, you're telling your customer gets to drive your car every month for as long as they pay up to the end of the note, and then they get the title to the car, or if they're leasing, they get another car. It's really never been the car business. I have people call me up and say, I want to get in buy here, pay here because I love cars. Buddy, this is the wrong business for you. Because anybody in here who's been doing this for a long time will tell you, God, I wish those cars didn't ever break. God, I wish I didn't have to buy those old cars with high mileage. This is a finance and collections business. We are much closer related to rent to own than a car dealership. Really? Right? They might be doing refrigerators and sofas, and we're doing cars. And cars is really just transportation. Um, and it is about, you heard Kenya say, it is about your balance sheet and your cash flow and way less about your P&L statement. Because the one thing I learned early on, I used to do payroll, because I was a CFO of our company. I said, why did we sell so many cars, and we've made so much money, and I'm worried about making payroll this week? Because buy here, pay here will keep you broke. And the bigger you grow and the faster you grow, the broker you'll be. Even though it says you made a lot of money on paper, where's all your profits? In the street. Okay? You haven't made a nickel. I don't care what your gross profit is. We had that discussion yesterday. We have in every one of our 20 groups. What's the right number? Until you collect it, it doesn't matter. Right? This is what we do. We have to collect the cash. Um, we do have to sell a car or lease a car to create a loan. That's what we have to do. Right? That's the way that's going to work out there. So there is a retail aspect of this. Is it hard to sell cars and buy here, pay here? Scott says yes. Today it is. I will tell you a funny story is that in the last couple of years, my dealers in my 20 groups that I moderate, who've been, most of them have been doing this 20 or 30 years, they say, you know, Chuck, it's just not fun anymore. And I'll just tell you guys who are in this business, don't get depressed. It just used to be fun. And now it's hard. It's even hard to buy cars, to recon cars, to sell cars, right, to market and sell cars. And then collections, that's always been the same. Um, but we got to collect our profits out. And how long does it take you to get to a profitable position in your cars? Do you guys know your number to break out of the car? Okay, Mike and I go back a long, long way. We measured that in weeks. We actually wanted to be out of our car by the time they made their second pickup payment. By the time they got that second temp tag, we wanted to be out of the car. 
Now our average is 15 months till you break out of the car. And that's usually beyond when your repo curve kind of peaks out. So this is hard. So we got to make it work. Um, how, where'd you guys learn to collect? On the fly, how many just on the fly just, here's a phone and a list and let's go? Yeah, you learn the hard way, right? You got to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, did anybody go to classes or training to learn? Did anybody come see me? Oh, sorry. Um, and you're going to throw things at me because you say, but you said, in 2005, you said, do it this way. I said, yeah, I probably did in 2005 say do it this way. Uh, today I'm going to talk about this is 2019 and we're heading into 2020. So is it really different today? What's interesting to me is you guys have so much technology that we never had back in the day. I mean, it's just it's mar remarkable. But guess what hasn't changed much in my 30 years? Delinquency, recency, and charge-off rates. They haven't changed dramatically. No one's got the secret pill. Why, is, why do you think it hasn't changed that much? The customer is the freaking same, right? And that is probably, and people go like, well, God, our customers are so bad, I can't believe you did this deal. It's like, every one of our customers is this person. That's our business model. You want 700 credit scores, probably need to go over to a new car store and get them sold. And oh, by the way, make no money at it. Because this is our business model. These are our people. We love them. The thing is that they're not the same, but they are the same, meaning that they behave the same, right? It's about priorities in their lives. And we're not going to get into that today, but that hasn't changed much at all. So I want to talk to you guys about let's collect more money from each customer with less effort more often. So that's really what this is about. And most of our technologies, if used correctly, have made us more efficient, more effective. Okay, but it's not going to change. It doesn't give customers jobs. I used to tease people about putting, putting a device in the car. It's like, that's awesome. I can track that car. But it didn't give him a job because he can't pay because he doesn't have a job. It didn't fix his car, Mike. His car's broken. His car's broken. doesn't matter how you're structured. So there's a lot of things that, that go into our customers becoming failures instead of successes that really don't have, that technology can't fix. It can only make it cheaper to do the same job or even a better job. So let's talk about that. Collections begins at underwriting. Do you guys heard that before? Right? Okay. It starts with the customer coming in and filling out the credit app or doing it online or coming down and having an interview. If you go through an interview process or all your verification process. But if you don't do that right, good luck. Now, what do you guys think? Is how much does underwriting play a role in how the notes, notes pay out? 70%? 50-50? Less than 50? So I'll tell you what's interesting, because I have dealers who are both, I have dealers who are like, they, they underwrite like banks. I mean, they, they put you through the ringer to buy a car from them. And then I've got dealers who just do the old, we call it the mirror test, fog the mirror, right? If you can fog the mirror, you get a car. If you can't fog the mirror, we just need a cosigner. Okay. Good collections can overcome bad underwriting. The other way doesn't really work. If you don't know how to collect these notes, it doesn't matter how good a deal it was. Right, because our customers are used to people calling them and telling them it's time to pay. And not just us, we always forget that we're not the only bill sitting on their dining room table that they haven't paid yet, and people are calling them or emailing them or mailing them out there. But it's important to underwrite, and one of the challenges is that I, I you know, someone had to hit me over the head. How many of you guys underwrite or approve loans based on how you feel about the customer and you're talking to them? Okay, how many of you guys think you're good at it? I could literally get a trained monkey who would be as good as you. Me too. And here's the problem. There's, part of it is on us. If you do a subjective underwriting process, then what's going to happen is it's going to be how you feel that day. I'd never forget one of my guys who worked for me, and we had a scoring model, and he didn't want to use it. And a customer came in who was a temp worker. And they were going, oh, I hate temp workers. I go, well, we have a scoring model that builds that in for a plus or minus in a scoring model, right? But he said, but I had somebody repo yesterday who was a temp worker. Well, yeah, you had 12 temp workers pay yesterday, too. Oh, you didn't call them. So we want to make sure that in our underwriting that we come up with the fundamental things that really make a difference, a material difference in our collectability, but we also want to make sure that we do it objectively as we possibly can. And make exceptions, exceptions. So if you guys use, I heard someone say, I think Steve said, we use AutoZoom, but we don't really use it. Then throw it away. The whole point of it is to build a box which your customers need to fit in to say yes. Right? And if they don't fit in the box, every once in a while there's a story associated with somebody. 
I had a lady who had three repos on her credit bureau, but they were all joints. She had signed for her three rotten children, and they all repoed. That was a story, right? They weren't hers. But in most cases, they fit in the box or they don't fit in the box. You heard yesterday talking about debt to income. I'm always challenged by the debt to income because that's what all banks use for prime underwriting of mortgages and car loans, right? What's your debt servicing every month compared to what's your take home? And of course, banks use gross. But our customers, I can tell you one thing. I don't care what their income is, 6,000 a month or 1,400 a month. How much of that do you think they spend every month? And then some. Okay, so that whole thing, because I mean, if you guys have done budgets, I tried to do budgets for years, you know, and you, and you forget, oh my God, I forgot about cigarettes, and I forgot about scratch-off tickets, and I forgot about the fare, and all the things that they don't think about, right, that they spend all their money on. So you start going through that and saying, listen, I want to make sure they make enough money, and income is the number one, number one credit criteria you should all use, is can they afford the car payment? And it's our duty to make sure we put them in an affordable payment. Have you guys ever done a static pool by payment size? How do the $300 a month people pay compared to the $400 compared to the $500? You mostly find, man, those cheaper payments pay better. Ding. Yeah, now we can't find those cars anymore, but that always works. You guys have criteria for job, what kind of job, or where they work, or job time? Okay. Is it meaningful? We've done a lot of static pools for us, and I will tell you, whenever I say our static pools are the ones that we look at for our dealers is, that's their pool. Don't hear and say, well, that's what they said. Mike, you need to know what your people are doing in Pinellas Park, Florida. But the reality of it is we found that, oh, my God, job times between six months and two years are the exact same charge-off rate. Above two, they get better. Below that, they're a little sketchier. But we got, we got so crazy about saying they must have a six-month job. And it's like, and we're turning down good deals for that. Um, residence and residence time, you guys have underwriting guidelines for that? You know what I found out was the number one teller? How long have you been in the area? You know what? If, if you're a Columbia, South Carolina resident and all your family's there, I feel really good. If you've been here since Thursday and you came here because you fell in love with some dude, yikes. Okay? Because that isn't going to work. There are no ties to the area. It be, might be way more important than how long you've been in the trailer, the duplex, the house. Right? It doesn't matter nearly as much as you may think. How many of you guys pull bureaus or alternate data? Okay, we're getting a lot of information already, aren't we? And what do credit bureaus tell you? <clears throat> what do credit, first of all, what do credit scores tell you? Nothing. I mean, kind of nothing. Now, we do know that when you get above 625, 650 FICO scores, they go, man, they start to really become material. Okay, I never saw one of those people. Well, one guy, but he had stolen someone's identity. But the actual customers and buy here pay are about a 535 FICO score, and they're very challenging. So. We pull bureaus, and most dealerships pull bureaus and say, I just want to see if their story is true. Does it line up, right? It's kind of like a little polygraph test. They said they've been here for seven years. I got an address in Arizona an hour ago. Okay, we might want to talk. There's those kind of things, but the actual credit scores for most of the people today, especially today, uh, who come into your dealerships are probably not very material. The one thing that's happened in Buy Here Pair that's made it so hard besides cars and that you're in competition today with everybody <clears throat> is we no longer get what I lovingly call the cream of the crap customer, right? That customer who has a $4,000, $5,000 income, that customer who has a good paid car loan or two, where are they? New car. New car. They're at CarMax. They're somewhere where they can get a car that I can't afford to sell probably, and I can't compete against that. Or there was some crazy you know, finance company that you know, are doing it wrong, but they bought the deal. Um, we worried really hard about references, and I'm going to talk about references in a few slides. How many of you people got to talk to the job and the landlord before you deliver a car? Okay. So that's, I, I used to teach that. That's old school. Mike, you don't do it. We don't either. You know what it changed? Nothing, except I got deals done faster. Yeah. Right? I mean, I took their pay stub, tried to confirm that it was real, not fake. Uh, the good news is most of them are very bad at fake pay stubs. When they get really good at it, I'm going to get really nervous. But most of them, they're bad at it. I had one little neighborhood in <clears throat> Hillsboro Avenue, Tampa, Florida, where one of our clients was making them for her friends. The great news was they were all the same. So we got caught on a couple, but then after that, it was like, nope. But landlords and employers, friends and family, all that great information you get, and then lo and behold, you're sitting there with a bureau, a deal, references, landlord, 
hopefully you've calculated what their take-home pay is to look at all this stuff. And you're going like, okay, how do you put that together by yourself in your brain? Well, that's if I'm hungover or happy today. If it's the end of the month, we were famous for end of the month deals, right? Our criteria for underwriting is exactly the same, except for those last three days, because we're off. Okay, if you do that, I'll tell you about that static pool, how those work out for you. And then, of course, deal structure does matter. It does matter that you put them in a payment that they can afford. How many of your customers have said, I can't afford the payment you just put down on the car I want? Cannot afford. None. I've had customers walk in $1,300 a month income, land on a car that's going to be a $600 a month payment. You know what they say? I can swing it. I can do that. Right? No, you can't. Okay? And if you want that car, go across the street. There's a guy over there who will do that deal. So anyway, this is the one area that we're not going to change, but we may change for you because it's critical to buy here, pay here collections, but it's probably the one that we don't do enough of. We're really good at going through and verifying and holding the customer there for hours and sometimes days and come back tomorrow and do your customer interview and all these things. But when you've made a deal with a customer, you have one last chance before they leave in your car to drive to parts unknown where nothing can be done to communicate with them. One last chance to say, here are the rules of this car loan. So how many of you guys have your salesmen or sales managers close loans? And we'll admit it. Yeah, what do they care? Their commission comes tomorrow, okay? I want people in your dealership who are either independent of your sales team uh, or part of your collection team. Um, if you guys are one, one roof operations, I would love for the collector slash account manager to meet and greet them. I'm the person who's going to help you be successful in this loan. I'm the person you call when you can't make a payment for any reason. I'm the person you call when you even have a car problem. You know what, you know what salesmen say when a customer calls the salesman and has a car problem? What does the sales guy say? Or girl. Either A, not my job, man. Don't call me. Or, yeah, bring it in. We fix everything. That's my sales, guys. Bring it in. We'll fix it. Okay? So it's a time to, to, to talk to them. It's the critical to setting the expectations of what's going to go on and how it's going to work. Um, all aspects of the loan collection process, and they have an understanding of it. I know some people have done secure clothes, and some people have done videos, and some people have little flip chart processes in there. And it's, I know they say, oh, they're not paying attention. Some people will never pay attention, right? There are people you're going to sell a car to today that will probably not make a payment or make one or two and be done. I mean, right? That's just part of it. I'm not sure I could pick those out. If I could pick those out, I'd probably be selling you that in a pill, okay? But what I can say is no one's going to leave my dealership or my finance company without a clear understanding of our obligation to them and their obligation to us. Um, payment frequencies and start dates. I can't tell you how many times customers said, no, I didn't say I, didn't get, I didn't say I get paid every other week. I, I didn't say I get paid this Friday. Those are the things you want to make sure. I'll rewrite a contract, Mike. If I go in there and say, no, 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 I don't get paid this Friday, I get paid next Friday. Someone asked me yesterday during, uh, when Steve was up on the panel here, he said, how do most people pay? I said, weekly, very weekly. He didn't get it. So you didn't either. <laughs> I said, I've, listen, I had 15,000 accounts at our peak all monthly. We got them to pay. Some people do all weekly. Some do all biweekly. They have a dealership that's been in business since 1969. They're all semi-monthly. And most of you guys are probably payday. It, it, it all works, just so you know. Don't freak out about that. But I'll tell you, you're never going to teach our customers the difference between semi-monthly and bi-weekly. <laughs> I used to do a calendar and highlight the three payments, and uh, forget it. Okay? All I told them is, did you get paid today? Uh-huh. Then you owe me money. You get a paycheck? Uh-huh. You owe me money. All right. Um, the other one we talked about is, is electronic. You heard Rick Johnson up here yesterday from Virginia talk about recurring electronic payments. Um, and it's really interesting because in our 20 groups and looking at our, our group averages and our benchmarks, the number of people on electronic recurring payments is somewhere between 5% and 75%. Dear God, okay? How many of you guys are in the 50 plus percent electronic recurring payments? So they must all pay. If you're below that number, and I would tell you, one of my guys who's been doing this for a long time said to me, you know, Jeff, we got as high as in the low 70s, but a lot of that we were putting on, they're coming right back off. He says, you know, when we're about 50 to 60%, that seems to be a number that's sustainable. 
But imagine, Mike Clark, you and me, back in the Suncoast Auto Broker days, 50% of our people are going to pay us without us ever touching them. We just said, that can't be. That's so awesome. The higher you can get that number, the less collection effort you have. Um, warranty claims, vehicle issues. And again, this is a place where you don't say, I'm in a hurry, we're really busy, it's Saturday, I couldn't close them, I'll call them later. Don't do it. Don't do it, because once they're gone, how many of you guys do welcome phone calls after they leave? I'm a big proponent, right? Great. How many of them call, answer your call? Oh, I have one guy in there, like 18 phone calls on welcome calls they didn't answer. I said, okay, you can stop now, okay? We're not getting through to this cat. Anyway, keep doing that one and change that one. All right, buy here, pay here. Pay here, right? It's, 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 in, our, it's in our name, okay? That's when I first started, just to get you guys in jail. Again, no, no computers. $50 or $60 a week payment, some 40s. Cash only. See you every Friday. I don't care how you get paid. You must pay here. And, they, and I didn't really understand that other than I didn't know. They didn't have checking accounts. They didn't have debit cards. They didn't have it. We had no websites. There was no place to go online, no portal pays. We didn't have any of stuff, so it kind of made sense for that. But man, is that a lot of work for a two-year note? 104 Fridays in a row? Any of you guys do something for 104 Fridays in a row without screwing up one? Right? No, that's a hard thing for anybody to do. Um, but we took cash. It was simple. We want to see the car. How many of you guys say we want to see the car? Because that's an old buy here, pay here tenant, isn't it? Scott, I don't want to see the car. You know, and they say, like, yeah, but they'll come in and buy another car. No, they'll come in and want a car when they can't have a car. I want a payment in my bank. I'll do whatever it takes to get that payment in the bank. Um, but you guys have to create varied ways for them to pay. Overcome objections to payments. Because the one thing about buy here and the pay here part is, I can't get there today. That's the number one, right? Why? A million excuses, but it's I can't get there today. So I'm going to offer you lots of ways to pay. Okay? Whether you use something like a pay near me. We used Ace Cash Express in Florida. Right? You can go there. And they're like, really? I can go there? We can have a kiosk so that it just takes a payment. I don't have to have a person there. We have a portal pay or somewhere online on our website or through our DMS that you can pay. We take all cards, debit, credit, whatever. We don't care. You guys have it made compared to what we used to. Right? Got to be here on Friday. Hope you show up. Hope that car is running to get you here. <clears throat> I don't need to see the cars. The one interesting thing is cashiers. And I know, how many of you guys have cashiers? Okay. That's old school. Um, we used to have cashiers. We had 27 stores at one point uh, in the 90s, and we had 27 cashiers at stores, right? That's a lot of payroll for one. Um, but then, of course, we were open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., so we had to have shifts of cashiers, right? And back in the day, and now I think back, and man, I wish we had the kiosk. If you want to come pay at that car lot you bought the car, there's a machine right over there. The machine's expensive, but guess what? It'll never call in sick. There's no ba baby daddy drama, right? There's no missing money. Uh, for the volume we were at, I would have done that because cashiers can't balance squat. And they cost a lot of money, too. Um, if you make it easy for them to pay, they will pay better. That's some simple, isn't it? They will pay you before they pay somebody else. And this is really what we're doing. It's a musical chair of bill paying, right? Those they need the most and those that talk the most and those that make it easy are first. And somebody loses every month. You know that, right? Because if you guys are collectors, you know, you hear them say, I can't pay you right now, man. I'm behind on my rent. Then rent just one. It's the nature of their lives. So collections is cheaper when you give them multiple ways to pay because it takes less effort on our part to find them. All right. Here's where the big one starts changing. Communication. So <laughs> the first one up there, again, all you young people, you ever heard the term no phone, no loan? Steve and I are going, yeah. That meant a landline. That means you had a phone on the wall or a princess phone sitting on your desk, desk right there that, right at your house. How many of your customers do you think have landlines? I have one. I have no idea why, because I'm old, right? I don't, my wife goes, what's our phone number at home? I go, I don't know. But I know if it rings, I don't want to answer it. Because <laughs> no friend, no colleague is calling me on the landline. Okay, Our customers do not have landlines. 
98% of them have a phone. 80% of them have a smartphone, and they live and die. And oh, by the way, that phone is going to get paid before we get paid. 100%, right? And yes, they changed numbers because they forgot to pay the bill, got cut off, and went to the next carrier out there. But they're cell phones, okay? So one of the things that's interesting is about how many of you guys get messages from people, whether it's text or whether it's a phone message, on your cell phone? Yeah? Yeah? How many of you guys get messages at your house? I, right now in my office, so just so you know, if you ever want to call me, if you call the office number, there's a blinking number in there on my phone that says I have 92 messages. Last month it was 84. It's going to be a million, right? Because Mike's not going to call that number. And it's kind of where we are with the home phone, too. Like, everyone I get, oh, look, it's funeral plots. Now it's getting to be funeral plots, so I know it's not good in my life, right? <laughs> they must know something I don't know. But we communicate with them. When you call them on their cell phone, and if even they, they don't answer, guys, they got the message. That's the beautiful thing about cell phones. And where's your cell phones right now, everybody? How close? It's near my heart. How often is it near my heart? 24-7. I, my wife is a freak. Like literally, I do put mine away at night, and hers is by the bedside table. Is it not? How many of you guys have a bedside table on your phone? Oh, my God. Like, you really going to answer that at midnight if it blinks and lights up and there's some text about some stupid sporting event that just happened? Yeah, my wife does that. They do it, too. But if you're going to do electronic communications, emails, or texting out there, and there are a lot of rules, and there's some discussion today with the TCPA session about how to do it correctly. It's really important that you guys do it correctly. And I'll give you an example. Do you guys see that you guys have a lot of lawyers in your town that are on TV, like we do in the Tampa Bay area? The Morgans and Morgans of the world? They love unwanted phone call cases. It's $1,500 per call if you're found guilty of breaking the TCPA. Well, that may not sound like much, but when they say, let's go back through your collection record, Steve Wedding, and say, oh, you made a million calls to an unwanted number, times 1500, zero, zero, right? They love those cases out there. So if you're going to get it, you better do it the correct way. And texting, you can talk about the opt-ins and the opt-outs, and they have the right to cancel every single time. But you better get them to sign an electronic communication agreement at the time of sale. If it's not in your contract, get an addendum, have a lawyer, not your DMS system, a lawyer bless it, and say, sign this, you're giving us the right to communicate with you electronically. One of the challenges that you're gonna find with old school collectors is, and old people, is we hate texting versus phone calls. But I, I have a daughter, she's 32 years old, she's a lawyer, she lives in Tampa, but when she was going to law school up in Tallahassee, I could call her 100 times and she would answer the phone, how many? Zero. If I texted her, I would get a response back in how many seconds? Like two, <laughs> right? One of the things that we do, we do it in sales too, we do it in our marketing departments too, but we do it in collections is, oh my God, when someone says to you, I wanna talk to you via text or email, that's how you should talk back to them. Whether you like it or not, it's not my problem. You don't convert people to the other kind of communication very well, do you? No. Just make sure you do it. But with mobile and electronic communication, I can assure you they got the message. I can assure you. So you don't have to, now it's a matter of I'm ignoring you, right? But it's, they got the message. The message at the answering machine at home, they never got it. And God forbid, how many of you guys send mail out to customers? And I don't mean your right to cure or your 10-day letters. I don't mean the stuff you have to by law in your state. I'm talking about, I'm going to send them a letter saying they're past due. Anybody do that? Because I just want your postage. Okay, because the greatest thing about mail is, Jeff Watson, I never got it. And I'm damn sure not opening it because I know there's nothing in there that I want to read. Is there? No. And how long does it take to get mail when we're talking to them immediately the other way? So you've got to make sure that you are communicating with them electronically. Okay, references is my favorite thing because I taught this. And for those who've been to my class over the years and say, you said 12 references, six friends and six family. Anybody do something like that as part of their process? Yeah. It's just old school. How many of you guys, do you have some number that you have to contact before you'll let them drive away in your car? Yeah, that's normal. Okay, we've got dealers now, and a lot of this has to do with those unwanted calls. So they said, we got rid of references. We don't take them at all. Because we certainly can't market them unless they opt in, right? That's a law. So we're not going to market those people. We didn't call them. We didn't get their permission. So we stopped doing it. And guess what happened to collections? Nothing, <laughs> nothing. It was like when we stopped taking payments, Mike and I at our company, 
Someone stole a bunch of money in Orlando store, and Mr. Smith said, we're done. No more payments at the store. And I'm that president of the finance company. I'm like, well, I'm pretty much fired. And the next time I'll get my resume ready. We stopped taking payments at the store in 30 days, 27 stores, and nothing happened. It's like references. It's amazing, especially for anybody. How many of you guys use GPS in this room? Okay, the record shows 90%. Where's your car? Uh, I know where it is. Right? I know where that car is better than her mom or his mom knows where that car is. True? Okay, yeah, there's some are tampered with and some are broken. And most of what I found out through my experience in the dealerships was, oh, my God, most of our GPS problems were poor installation. It was on us. It wasn't on the device itself. If we didn't wire it very good or use good wire. But we don't need references. I've got some dealers who said, you know what, Chuck, we're taking a different approach. We're going to take five or six references for a feeling. It's like pulling the bureau. Okay, they're all local. Because I've seen reference sheets that you guys have out there, and there's a guy's name, first name only, it's Joe, and his seven-digit phone number, they wrote down four of them. That's awesome, right? If every reference is out of state, I probably might have concern. But if you're going to continue to do references, and I'm not against it, it's just it's a lot of time consumption to try to get people on the phone and talk to them, is you must get their permission to call them in the future. And you better have something, whether it's a recording of their voice or something they're going to sign or something online they can docu-sign that says, I give you permission to call me in the future. And if they say stop, Luke, stop. Just stop. Okay? It's one thing that's going to keep you out of trouble. The other thing that is interesting is everyone who does references and says, well, our collectors call references. It's, it's, it's imperative that we have references in there. And then I go in and I look at collection departments all the time as part of my job and start going through collector notes and going like, well, nobody in this department calls references based on the collector notes because there aren't any. Or there's 12 messages to a reference. That's, that's just pencil whipping, pretending you're working, right? So you don't really need to have them the way you think they have. And then if you're going to do it, get consent. And number three, make sure your collectors are actually calling references or then forget about it. Um, door knocks, visits, field calls, whatever you want to call them. How many of you guys do them? Yeah, it's a much smaller group than it used to be. We cut our teeth on doing that, did we not? Matter of fact, I like going out there in my ninja suit at night, right? Going into the hood to see if the car's there. I was young then and stupid. Right? You get shot at once, you figure out, oh my God, I almost got killed over a 12-year-old Ford Taurus. I'm not doing that anymore. So I ask you guys this. Number one, field calls are very scary in the world of compliance because anything you do in the field, whether it's a door hanger on the door or talking to the neighbors, can be considered third-party disclosure. Okay? Mike, if I go to your house and say I'm from the finance company, and is Megan here, you already know why I'm there. Did I have to say anything about it? No. Nope. So that's what, the, that's what the CFPB has said, and that's what some of the states are starting to say, is that they know that there's no reason for you to be there other than a collection notice, and therefore you just disclosed. Second thing, how many of you guys find it dangerous to be out there in the field? If you don't, you must be doing business in a better neighborhood than me. It can be dangerous. How many of you guys send your own people out to do it? We used to do that, right? Problem is, most of you guys really need to check on this. Go back to your insurance carrier and your agent and say, hey, are we covered for our collectors getting shot in the field? They said, no, no, you said they were desk workers. Most of you guys are not covered. Should anything that they do that hurts somebody or they get hurt? And again, we had somebody get hurt. We stopped. It's the end of the world. I got my resume ready again, Steve. We stopped doing them, and guess what happened? Nothing. Nothing. The other problem is somebody says, well, no, no, we, we source that, we outsource that, we have a company out there and they charge us $50 for a visit. I, you guys think that's cheap. To me, that's ridiculously expensive. Not that it wouldn't cost me labor hours to send my own people out there, but $50 and I send people out there 10 times a week and it's five or $600 or it's $1,000 a week and it's $52,000 a year. For them to go out there and you got, unless you have GPS on them, you don't know that they really went out there, dropped the door hanger or whatever they said they did. And then of course, anything that they do on your behalf Regardless of any hold harmless you've signed, they're an agent of yours. So you better be really certain that they're good people, whether it's your repo agent or some outside company, because they can get you into a lot of trouble. Devices. Well, most of you guys said you had GPS devices. One of the things that's very interesting about uh, starting up in GPS, um, first of all, in the compliance world, states, 
why you need to be in your associations, why you need to go to Washington and go to your state capitals and get involved with this stuff is they don't know there's a difference between the two items. They call them all the same and they make a lot of rules where they lump them together. It's like, wait a second, a start or interrupt is way different than a GPS, right? But there's a lot of concerns, more concerns out there about the devices. Um, but what a start or interrupt can do for you and should do for you is what? Make your delinquencies and charge outs go to zero. No, no, I told you it doesn't fix their cars and give them a job. But a start or interrupt, how many of you guys use start or interrupt? Okay, yeah, quite a few. What does it make the customer do? Call. It is forced communication. Nothing more. Didn't, like I said, didn't give them any money, right? But it made them call you, and that's its value. What's the value of a GPS device? Location. Where's my car? Get it now. Get it sooner before it's behind a fence, in a garage, in an impound, in a wreck. I can't tell you how a dealer in Indiana brought a brand new collection manager in. They had 2,000, 3,000 accounts, pretty big operation. And three times we were going through his collection results after a 20 group meeting, and I'm going through them, and three times he let a customer say, I'm going to turn in the car, but I'm going to do it on Monday. One impound and two wrecks. What are the odds that's going to happen on a weekend with our customer? 50-50. Uh, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, no, if they say pick up my car, I pick it up. But I want to know where the car is. I want to ping the car. A lot of people say I don't want to ping the car. One of the challenges we still face is we don't really have seamless integration the way you'd like to have, where I could click a button in my DMS and it pops on that screen. Most of my collectors always had two screens or more, right? One's to track GPS and one's to do all the notes and the payment taking. But that's really where I, would ping. I told people, ping the car. If they're not responding to the call, at least ping the car. I know it's tracking but ping the car and see when they say they're in, the, they're in the Grand Canyon on vacation and the car pings at Walmart around the corner, I would like to know that. For no other reason than I'd like to know that. So anyway, a GPS is a great device and it's expensive. And why is a GPS device expensive? Even if they're at the lowest prices ever. We didn't use them when we had our big company because they were costing four or $500 back in the day. Now they're under 100 on my $7,000 average ACV car, my $1,200 average recon, now it's just another $100. But most people don't need them. That's the challenge of it, right? And who do you got to put them on? Some, anybody put them on certain people? <laughs> Never, don't admit that, right? I know some people say on car value, that type of thing. It's like, look, it's like we're in or we're out. We put them on everybody because I don't know. If I knew who needed a GPS, I would should have turned them down. So a lot of people don't really need them, and so they're very expensive that way. But I would also argue this. So if you have a 39-month loan, and you have a $100 device, it's $2.50 a month to know where the car is. Mike, I'm in. You guys in? To know where the car is. Yeah, until they tamper with it. And take it out and put it on somebody else's car, and I repo that car by mistake. That's never happened this month. All right, collection departments. Um, I had 54 collectors at our peak. They all worked for me. <clears throat> it was a lot of labor back in the old days. Um, there were always metrics, and we have benchmarks in our 20 groups. How many accounts per collector is correct? Oh, no. This is a trick question, just so you know. Well, first of all, it would depend on what your delinquency is, wouldn't it? If you have 1,000 accounts in your portfolio and 50% of them are past due, that means 500 accounts need work, right? Unless they're all charge-offs you haven't taken yet. Well, you need about four or five collectors for that pool. What if that same guy has 1,000 accounts and he runs no more than 10% delinquency? That's one collector. That's what matters first. But I can tell you that we use it on how many past due accounts at the peak of any week or month. That's kind of like, that's the most you need. But, but like salesmen and like mechanics with your collection team, it's not bad to have a little bit more help than less. So how many of you here have one or two collectors in this room? Okay, you have one collector and they get hit by a car. Now how many do you have? Okay, zero is a really bad number. And when John Stepanek says, I'm stepping in and doing it, he'll be at the auction all day, because that's safe, right? If you have two collectors and one goes away, you've lost 50% of your collection effort. It's really challenging out there because nobody's going to step in. And there's a lot of people in my dealership that I wouldn't want to step in. You want your sales guys making calls? Dear Lord. Right? So it's a really challenging thing to be there. But the right amount has changed. And what I'm asking you guys today with all this new electronic communications and electronic payments is, how many accounts can they handle if we're texting them? 
versus trying to find them on a phone call. They should be able to handle more, right? But what do people do as, as a rule? They make work fill the time. Do they not as a rule? So what happens is, like, man, my collector, she's on the phone, I love, she's on the phone all day. Let's go, let's go to the phone record, Scotty. Let's go see how much she did. Well, she was here eight hours, and uh, she made 12 calls. She uh, texted 4,000 people, and um, she skipped trace one cat who's been missing for three years. Is that a good day? No. The other thing is we've got to work on it. So you can set up your, your collections, cradle to grave. Everyone know what that means? However you divide up your accounts, if I get it on the account rep, it's my baby till I get him a title or I repo him. No, it never changes hands. Buckets or tiers, and tiers not crying, but tiers, levels of delinquency is this group works my 1 to 15, this group works my 15 to 30, this group does my 30 plus, this group over here does my 60 plus. Okay, both of those ways work, but there are challenges with both. If you're, a buck, if you're a cradle to grave collector, then that collector, he or she needs to have every skill. They need to be able to take, be nice to a person who's one day past due and be able to skip trace and do an insurance claim and get a car out of impound and all these type of things. When you do buckets, you're one to 15 or one to sevens, whatever, they're just nice. Hey, we missed you, can we set you up? Can I take your payment over the phone? Can I get you set up on portal pay? And your 60 days are probably the nastiest people, right? Those, and I had those, and I said, you've got to get me my car, you have 30 days. I don't care, get me my car. They've struggled being nice, right? That's a personality thing. But what happens with bucket collectors is, when it counts in their bucket and it's getting near the end of their bucket and they've struggled, what do they do? Work harder. Let that thing get on someone else's desk tomorrow. Right? Not my problem anymore. And the problem is that the next collector who has to get them has to what? Learn everything about that customer. Right? Because they don't know a thing about it. It just pops on their desk for the very first time. We love cradle to grave. I had a hybrid system, which was it's cradle to grave, but I had an insurance specialist. I had an impound and repo specialist. I had some people take care of that stuff, skip tracers, because that's, you know, how long does it take to skip trace a customer? Somewhere between one minute and the rest of my life, right? How many people in here like to skip trace people? Yeah, it's always with the dealer group, it's always nobody, right? Because they know there's no money in it. Collectors, love, some of them love skip tracing. Even if it only is, I worked one account today, boss, for eight hours, and they're going to make a $100 payment. That's awesome. They're 12,000 past due. And they live in another state. You know, you could have called 50 real people and got me 20 grand today, right? But that's a collector behavior model. It's like, I like to find those people. One of the other things is, how many of you guys work nights and weekends for collections? Okay. So again, typical collections was you had to work every other Saturday or every Saturday half day or a couple nights a week and all this stuff. It's like, I would argue there probably is very little, if any, reason to collect after 6 p.m. or even on the weekends. Now, you're used to it, and many of your customers pay that way. Oh, we line them up on Friday. But if you don't line them up on Friday, they still pay. Okay? They will still pay, but what's challenging is trying to hire people who are willing to, who are going to be good human beings and also be a mom and have a real life and say, oh, by the way, you have to work all nights and weekends. You get a different group of people, do you not? Right? Anybody in the restaurant business or ever been in it? Yeah. How are restaurant workers? They're, the scary, they're like vampires, right? Because who wants to work till 1 or 2 o'clock every night? That's why they're always on the police blotter the next day, right? Because after work, we got a party. So you guys don't need to because remember, they're texting and emailing and calling them on their cell phones. They're getting the message at 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 1 p.m., 2 p.m. What happens at 7 p.m.? Nothing. Okay? Just think about it. Um, and of course, the higher the recurring electronic payments you set up, and your collectors can really help you if you don't get them point of sale, but to keep working them. When a, collector, when a customer's frustrated with me and says, man, why do you keep calling me? I say, you know what? I'm going to stop calling you, and here's how you can do it. It's in your court. I'm going to set you up on this recurring payment. It'll pay him automatically out of your pay, payroll deduct or whatever we're going to do for you. You'll never have to think about it again, and I won't bother you again. Collectors have a big influence on that. They also have a big influence on keeping the ones we signed up at sale on it. Skip that one. All right. So collections is job one. Collections for me, as an old guy, has never been easier because you have so many methods to communicate and so many methods to pay. We had one way to communicate, maybe, and one way to pay. Okay? It's just gotten harder because people are spending their money because they're sitting there on Amazon right now buying shit with your paycheck, right? I could pay my car payment, but man, I'm on Amazon and I need that. 
right? It's all, it's everybody. Still job one. And if your system is working for you, I'm not here to really tell you, forget everything you've learned. I'm just telling you that a lot of things that we feel we couldn't live without, cash payments, payments in person, landlines, references are important, doing field calls. We've seen many, 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 many dealerships who've taken the plunge to get away from those things we thought to be true and material, get away from it, and it's the same, okay? Um, these are mostly gonna be making you more efficient. They're not gonna make, they're not giving jobs, they're not giving paychecks. Customers will have, still have broken cars and lose their job and be incarcerated and you'll have to drop, they'll drop them off. All those things are gonna happen, so let's do it, let's do it as cheap as we possibly can. And um, stay the course, change some of this. I know some of you guys do some parts of what I talked about today. And if you wanna have more discussion or debate, I love debate, uh, come see me at the booth and we'll talk about this, we'll talk about 20 groups, we'll talk about all of our education. Thank you guys very much.